How's it going out there in Facebook streaming land? And, so, and YouTube uh, land. Yes, uh, YouTube land. Um, so our guest is running late. So all you people who tuned in to see Catherine Mary Stewart, she will be here. She's just running a little late. So we're just going to talk about some stuff, introduce some people, and wait for her to arrive. So don't go anywhere. She will be here. So uh, first we'll introduce Kevin, who's running the show. Kevin's the producer. He's pushing all the buttons, hopefully the all correct buttons at the correct time. Uh, we also got last from last week, we got Chris Byrne joining us again Hello. from his car. That's how yeah. dedicated this guy is. <laughs> and our special co-host this week, who we're going to talk to until uh, Catherine shows up, is uh, none other than Steve Gustafson. Uh, Steve, welcome. Oh, you're muted, I think. Yeah, we can't oh, hear you. <laughs> Nope, still can't hear you. The joys of the internet. There How we go. Think. There we Good go. Now? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. That's, we'll get all the bugs out of here. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Steve, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, you agreed to be one of my guest co hosts in this crazy, uh, you know, uh, podcast that we're doing here. So, why don't you tell people who don't know who you are who you are? Wow, um, that's that's a kind of a heavy, hefty load there. Um, <laughs> let me uh, let me put this up for those of you who might remember me from the, the original uh, Electric Company television series. Uh, this is my current book um, that's uh, uh, out and available. Uh, sort of a time frame of my life as a young performer uh, in the industry. Uh, I got started when I was uh, about six or seven years old. And uh, one thing led to another. And before I knew it, I was in New York with an agent. And, um, you know, my first gig was uh, getting cast in uh, production of The Music Man with John Raitt, Bonnie Raitt's dad. Um, and uh, also with a, a young, uh, young girl named uh, Denise Nickerson, who most of you might remember as the, uh, the blueberry girl from the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, Denise and I worked together in 1967 at that point, and uh, it was many years, not many years, but a few years later when I was doing the electric company that um, we, we lost Irene Cara after the first season, and they were looking for a replacement, and uh, I knew Denise was available, so I <clears throat> suggested that maybe they have her come in and meet with us, and we did a, a round of auditions and she fit in perfectly. So she ended up getting cast in the second season of the series. Um, I did Sesame Street um, in 1969. Uh, one of the first, I think it was like episode 13 or 14 of the first season of that show. Um, and not knowing that, you know, several years later, I would be going through a grueling audition process uh for uh the electric company which was a, a new series at the time very groundbreaking uh the idea of having a, a multicultural cast um and with names like bill cosby morgan freeman and rita moreno morgan obviously at that point wasn't a big star he was just a working actor trying to make a living so uh but rita obviously was you know an academy award winner and bill was had just come off of i spy so uh, it was kind of an interesting experience to be there with these uh, name people and doing all these crazy things that we were doing and getting to meet all these other guest stars that we had from Mel Brooks to Gene Wilder to you name it, who came in to do voice work and, and animation stuff that they were doing. Um, and uh, I ended up staying on that show. And in the, in the process of doing that show, um, we worked six months out of the year and then we shared the same production space with um, uh, Sesame Street. So they would shoot six months out of the year. We would shoot six months out of the year. And during that downtime, I would be doing other things, other shows. I would get cast in, in as a, as a well-known television person for a show like in Massachusetts at a, at a regional theater. Um, I was doing a lot of television commercials, a whole bunch of TV specials. Uh, I did one TV special with uh, Jack Lemmon um, and uh, it was a huge star-studded cast. I was the only kid in the show. It was a, it was called Get Happy, and it was a salute to the music of Harold Arlen, who was the guy that wrote all the original music for The Wizard of Oz. 
And uh, this was an idea that Jack was making his way down a yellow brick road and would come across a celebrity um, who then he would interact with and do a song that Harold Arlen wrote. And uh, we, had, uh, we had Jack Lemmon, Doc Severinsen, Mama Cass Elliot, Diane Carroll, Johnny Mathis, uh, and myself. And the song that uh, Jack and I did together was the famous song, It's a Quarter to Three, where, you know, there's no one in the place except you and me. So set them up, Joe. Well, I was Joe, and I was a, a bartender at a Kool-Aid stand on the, on the Yellow Brick Road. And there was a handmade clock that was on the bar that said quarter to three. So Jack comes in, and we have some dialogue with each other, and then he sees the, the clock, and he starts singing the song. And before I know it, I'm coming out from behind the, the Kool-Aid stand, and he and I are doing this big soft shoe routine together on the yellow brick road and then he ends up leaving and waving i wave goodbye as he makes his way down the yellow brick road and uh it was a really exciting time for me because i had an absolutely adored jack my favorite film at that time was the great race i just absolutely adored that film and, it's, and uh, we shot this thing we rehearsed in new york but we shot it in in uh canada in ontario in the middle of winter and we were staying at a hotel that was probably mm, at least an hour's drive from where the studio was. And I was there way into the night. I was the last thing to be shot at the end of the night. And it was like 11 o'clock at night. And this, of course, was before they had child labor laws that didn't <laughs> allow for you to work that late. So... The only two people left were Jack and I because we finished, we wrapped, and then I went to the dressing room and got him out of my costume. And I went out the, the back door from the, the stage door from the, the, the filming studio, and it was midnight, pitch black, with the exception of one strobe light that was like lighting in this alleyway. And it, there was supposed to be a van there that was going to take us from the studio back to the hotel. Well, apparently nobody bothered to tell the van driver that we were still there. So the van was gone. There was no way for me to get back to the hotel. So I'm standing out there in the snow. And the next thing I know, I see a pair of headlights coming around the corner. And I see this stretch limo. And it's starting to come towards me slowly, slowly through the, the snow, making the crunchy sound with its wheels as it heads towards me. And the car pulls up and the rear window drops down. And it's Jack. And he looks out the window and he goes, da, 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 get, get in the car, get in the car. You know, typical Jack fashion. So I got in the car and Jack was like, no, no, no. He says, you, you're riding with me. We're going to go back. Well, I was a kid in a candy store. I mean, I had an hour to grill him on the great race. Of course, I'm not talking about any of his other great films. I'm only concerned <laughs> about you know, Professor Fate. That was the only thing I wanted to know about. But he was so wonderful and so cordial. He answered all my questions, told me a great deal of anecdotes and, and onset antics that went on with him and and um, and Natalie Wood. And, you know, it was just, it was a lot of fun. We had a great, great time. And Jack always was one of my absolute favorites to work with. Um, the other really great experience that I had, and it was, it was in hindsight, again, not knowing the history of the person who I was with, only knowing certain films that they had done, but not their entire repertoire, was in, in 1970, I was in Las Vegas doing um, a production of MAME at Caesars Palace. It was the first time that, that the casino had ever decided to do a Broadway show. And it was something that the producers of the original Broadway show thought they could bring to uh, Vegas and you know give people there a chance to see a Broadway show. Now the deal is is that you do two shows a night and each show is only 90 minutes long. Well, Mame is a two hour and 40 minute play or musical. So they had to cut it down in order to uh, you know accommodate the two 90 minute slots. And in between there was a three hour break so that people could go and gamble and do whatever they wanted to do and then come back and have dinner and see the show. And the lead in the show at the time was Susan Hayward, um, who, you know, was just already a legend at that time. And I sort of knew who she was. And, and Susan and I hit it off really, really well. She had a, a son who was of military age. And there was one night I would come down in between each of the shows each night. and We would play 
cards in her dressing room. And I came down one night and she's, she's I'm knocking on the door and she's like, I'm on the phone. I can't, I can't, um, it's going to take a long while because I'm trying to reach my son in Vietnam. Hmm. So she's obviously now, you know, back then trying to communicate, in, in it, you know, trying to get a phone call out to the DMZ and, you know, a radio call to if he's out there in the, in the bush, it could take hours. So she said to me, she says, I have a guest waiting. Would you please, you know, would you please entertain him for a while while I wait for this phone call? So here I am, you know, I'm this, this, you know, 12 year old kid and I had just finished doing a show and I, I'm looking down and I see a pair of black patent leather shoes and I look up and I'm looking up and I keep looking up. And as I keep looking up, I wound up looking at the face of Charlton Heston, hmm. who was a good friend of hers. And he had come to see her in the show. And he looks at me and he puts his hand out and he says, oh, nice to meet you. He said, I really enjoyed your performance tonight. He said, look, she's going to be a while. So why don't we go grab a bite and then we'll come back. And I said, OK, sure. <laughs> so here I am with Charlton <laughs> and the main casino of Caesar Palace. And of course, all heads are turning. Everybody's going, what the hell is, you know, he, and he's tall and here I am, this little bitty kid. And we walk into one of the restaurants that they had in the, in the hotel. And of course, you know, this, the Red Sea parted and everybody, you know, was like, oh, <laughs> Mr. Heston, Mr. Heston. And they put us in a booth. And for the next two hours, I'm having dinner, a private dinner with Charlton Heston. And of course, again, I'm not thinking about you know, Ben Hur. I'm not thinking about, you know, Ten Commandments. What am I talking about? I'm talking about him as sign of the apes. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know. So again, you know, it, it's like hindsight is, is perfect vision. I just wish that I had been more aware. Of course, my parents were very aware of all these people were and were in shock, you know, for the most part when I would come back and I was walking with Charlton Heston or if I was doing a show where I had worked with Robert Ryan and Henry Fonda, you know, and, you know, it was just, it was crazy. My parents had grown up watching these people as megastars and here was their, their son playing opposite all these major names and they were just, you know, gobsmacked for the most part, but, but they, you know, they were, they were great about it and it was a fun time. It was not something that I ever really regret having, having continued to do. Yeah. I, I sacrificed childhood for sure. Um, you know, was on the road a lot and uh, traveling between New York and California and, and all of that. But uh, and then when I did move to California, wound up um, doing a bunch. I was like a I was a New York actor in California at a time when that was like a hot commodity. Okay, it was like they thought, well, you're you're stage trained versus just these kids that were just coming in off the street practically trying to do these shows. So I got cast in a number of projects. The first one being Shazam. Uh, was the episode in the first season called The Braggart, about a kid who is bragging about all these major things that he can do and winds <laughs> up telling them that he can he can go into the lion's cage and the lion won't hurt him. And, of course, Captain Marvel has to fly in at the very end of the show and <laughs> fight the lion, and then we save me and save us all. And, you know, it was, it was Shazam. What can I tell you? Mm. Um, it's but, pretty, uh, pretty awesome. If I was the braggart, I would be like, I can have dinner with Charlton Heston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'm I got this cast, anyways, I got whatever. Heston, James at sixteen. Um, I got Chips. Uh, you know, all these different shows that were the the hot thing at the at the time. But then in 1977, um, I got uh, I got cast in a two part movie for television out of Universal, uh, based on a Tom Tryon novel called The Dark Secret of Harvest Home. It was originally based on the Harvest Home novel by Tom Tryon, who also wrote The Other. Um, and it was a big deal. It was the most expensive TV movie ever made at the time. They spent like $11 million. And in 1977, you know what that, that comes out to be. But the big deal was, was that the lead was Betty Davis, um, which, you know, she was an icon at that point beyond, you know, reproach. And so I got cast and uh, that show also had Michael O'Keefe of, of, you know, uh, Caddyshack fame. Uh, it had a very young and first appearance of Rosanna Arquette uh, in her, one of her first TV stints. Um, and uh, we had a whole bunch of amazing 
uh, other actors that we had. Renee Bourgeois was in the show. Um, Norman Lloyd, who was a legend in the industry at the time, and he worked with Hitchcock, and he was, you know, very, very tight um, with a lot of the, the big names throughout the years. Um, and uh, it was a star-studded show that was being shot, of all places, in Ohio, uh, because it was supposed to be Connecticut, but there was no corn at that time in Connecticut, the only place they could find actual cornfields was in Ohio. So we got sent on location. Um, I had just had my 18th birthday. Literally the first day I arrived on location in Ohio, I turned 18. Um, got dissed by Rosanna Arquette like within the first hour. <laughs> um, she apparently thought I was some local Yoko and uh, didn't realize I was an actual major cast member. Uh, so she kind of did, so, you know, I kind of set her straight and said, excuse me, but I'm from California, you know, I'm here, we're, I'm, and when she saw that, she's like, oh, 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 okay, I'm, I'm very sorry, oh my God. That's, um, that's kind of messed up either way, you know? Yeah, yeah just way. being rude. <laughs> yeah, just, just being rude, but she was young, she was, you know, it was, was yeah. one of her first big, big jobs, so, you know, I think she was just trying to see how far she could push things. Hmm. Um but Michael Keefe was great. Loved Michael. Um, he was terrific and fun to, to be around. Um, he had brought his guitar with him everywhere he went, so he would always sing songs and hang out. One of the funny things that happened was that we we were on location and we were stuck in the middle of freaking nowhere. Um, and we were in a hotel right off of a major interstate with nothing but woods on either side of us. And the only thing to do was either eat in the coffee shop in the restaurant or walk across the highway to a gas station that had some pinball machines. And that was it. Otherwise, everybody hung out in their rooms and went from, we would, every night would be a party of just go from room to room to room with, you know, marijuana just floating above the room and every, everywhere you went. With Michael <laughs> strumming away on his guitar and you know, it was crazy, but we were stuck because it rained for 30 days straight. Uh, wow. That no exterior shots could be done. So we had to just wait. And it cost, it ended up costing the production far more than their original budget because of the downtime that we were all spent sitting in the hotel room. The great part about it was that I cleaned up on per diem, <laughs> and, you know, you're getting paid like $60, $80 a day in per diem cash for every day that you're there, but they pay for your meals. So wow. they were shelling out <laughs> dough like it was nobody's business. And my original three week contract ended up being for like eight weeks. And so it was, it was just, it was crazy. So we were literally stranded in this hotel. So here we all were just going from, you know, room to room and playing pinball and doing nothing while we waited to do just interior shots. Um, but I'll never forget my first scene with, with Betty. Um, I had, we had this big scene that took place inside of a um, kind of a community uh, town hall. And the sequence involved everybody, all the community, all of it, and this huge pile of corn in the middle of the room. And I was supposed to be, I'm, I'm in competition with Michael O'Keefe to become what they call the Harvest Lord. So it, comes, it ends up being between Michael and myself as to who's going to be the next Harvest Lord, and who's going to wind up being connected or marrying Rosanna Arquette's character at the end of the, end of the movie. So we've got all this business going on. I've got all these marks to hit. There's multiple cameras everywhere. And the sequence involved my diving into this sort of pile of corn trying to find what they call the neck it's a special ear of corn that it symbolizes that yes you are destined to be the harvest lord so i've been doing rehearsals trying to hit all my marks and at the end of the sequence i'm supposed to rise up and scream i have the neck i have the neck and then the crowd goes jimmy minerva has the neck and they turn me and there is this line of people on either side with the character called the widow at the end and that's betty davis and up until that point yeah rw we have Catherine, i guess all right yes great we do you want to interrupt uh inter in yeah you yes want to interrupt. You want to ladies interrupt. and gentlemen the moment you've been waiting for here she is Catherine mary wow. stewart oh Yay! my gosh hey oh, oh my hey, god Catherine. It, hey, Catherine. how are you 
I'm we're just good. talking about I uh, a lot of stuff. No, no, so, no worries, no worries. Steve, so Steve filled in for you. He was yeah. telling stories when he. I don't know if you've ever met Steve, but he was on. Uh, uh, he was on Patrick Electric Company as a that. child actor and did all this other stuff throughout his career. So he's one of my guest co-hosts. So he was filling in for you. <laughs> oh my God! Thank you. I appreciate that. I was. Uh, oh. I got all befuddled and caught up in another thing, and and oh, so I'm just yeah. out of the shower. My hair is still a little wet. That's you know, okay. You're here. What the heck? Yes. I'm here. Thanks and, for your patience, we, you guys. Like I, I said, we appreciate so much being here, and there's so much to talk about. In fact, um, real quick, it looks like it's the 38th uh, anniversary of Starfighter, the 35th anniversary of Dudes, and the 33rd anniversary of Burn, uh, Weekend at Bernie's. So, like, wow. this, the last week or the next two weeks or a week before or whatever – I mean, we've got all these anniversaries of your stuff, but um, tell us how it all started. I mean, I know you're from Canada, but like, were you like five years old and said, this is what I want to do or, or how did it all well, start? I was going to say, actually, I was five years old when I shot all that stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, I look really old for my age. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, uh, well, yeah, I'm from Canada. I know this is like, this is, uh, all these movies were released in the summer. I guess Weekend at Bernie's, somebody posted something that it was, what, July 6th? Fifth, fifth, it said from yeah. here, and Starfighter fifth? was July 13th, and Dudes was June 24th, according to IMDb. Okay, well, I trust IMDb, I guess, except for, <laughs> I hate them because they tell my real age. We can we can get a whole thing going about the age thing, but... Uh, you beautiful uh, still. Oh, still like, yeah, you're yeah, really me and Bucks. We were just talking uh, we're earlier about, show. like, you know, we're talking <laughs> earlier about, like, certain actors and actresses, or more, we're talking about Tom Atkins and how, like, he, he's looked the same, like, forever. forever. <laughs> but it's like you you haven't aged either. So yes. it's, oh, it's great. Oh, well, thank you. Just don't don't look too close. Look like <laughs> um yeah, no, I yes, so um to answer your question, I guess. Um yeah, I, I was born in Canada, born and raised in Canada. I left Canada when I was 18. I actually um I I come from a family family of academics. My dad uh, was a professor at the University of Alberta. My mom was a physiologist. Both my brothers were, you know, super smart. And then I came along and I was like, yeah, I hate school. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, when I was in high school, my dad uh, gave me this cartoon. I was just thinking about this just when you said that. Um, that said, I'm standing up in math, a cartoon of this little girl standing up in math class, and, he, and she's saying, excuse me, sir, um, what part of math do I need to know uh, in a career as an actress? <laughs> 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 now, that was some good forethought. At that time, I was uh, a dancer. I was studying dance, and that was my passion. I was a uh, passionate jazz dancer. And I was in a company in Edmonton called Synergy. Um, we, we traveled when I, I mean, we traveled, actually, I was underage <laughs> when I started traveling, I was like 16. And we were, you know, dancing around in different places where they allowed drinking and I wasn't really supposed to be 16. Um, but when I was 18, we also traveled to, um, uh, we we were on tour during Christmas for the UN peacekeeping forces, the Canadian contingency of the UN peacekeeping forces, and we traveled to Germany, Israel, Egypt, Cyprus. We did this whole tour, which was very very cool. And then when I graduated from high school, I moved to London, England, and studied at this. Um, it was kind of a general performing arts school called London Studio Center. It was, it, it's actually now quite a big school, well-known school there. At the time it was a year old and um, it was primarily dance, but they also had acting and singing and all sorts of other things like that. Um, so I, I would say, it, I have to blame my mother for everything. She was like, <laughs> okay, school is not doing it for this kid. So what else should we try? And we did gymnastics, we did art, 
you know, when I was very young, I ha had sort of a, I was very skinny and ugh, um, <laughs> little skinny thing, but I had the perfect ballet body. So she put me in ballet and I hated ballet because it was just far too structured and, you know, um, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, but she she sort of tricked me into going to this jazz class when I was about 14 and I fought her all the way. And she said, listen, if you don't like it, you don't have to go back. So I went and um, lo and behold, I stood at the very back. It was a crowded room full of little girls that were trying to learn how to dance. And the, the teacher pulled me up in front and she decided that I kind of knew what I was doing. I guess I picked up on it pretty quickly. And um, she had me come to the front to help sort of the other kids, uh, I don't know, see what the, the steps were or whatever. So um, uh, I, I was sort of instantly in love with dance at that point. Um, and I was passionate about it. When I moved to London, I studied, I got this incredible foundation at this school because like I said, it was a performing arts school. So it offered all sorts of different things. Not only every kind of dance you can think of, but um, like I said, acting and all that other stuff and singing. And, um, and then uh, one day I literally by chance ran into a couple of classmates who were on their way. They'd heard about this cattle call dance audition for a movie that was a rock musical. And I remember before I left Canada, my teacher slash mentor, she was like, if you get a chance to audition, do it because that'll be a great experience for you. Because in Canada, you know, I just, I was kind of like, um, it, it, it was sort of a natural progression that I ended up in the, in the company. And, you know, I really didn't have to work very hard at it, except that part of my dancing, I guess. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll just go to this audition and see what it's all about. So I went to this cattle call audition completely unprepared. You were supposed to come with a song and you know, all sorts of, I don't know what, you know, whatever you're supposed to have for an audition. Didn't have anything. The director pulled me out of this huge crowd of dancers, asked me if I could act. So of course I said, yeah. <laughs> Asked, asked me if I could sing, and I was like, sure. <laughs> and I ended up, uh, um, I auditioned for them. They gave me some sides, and they had me sing a couple of songs from the show, and, and I ended up in the lead role of this movie. And that is how I got into acting. Wow. I know the it's so, it's she's kind talking of about sick. is called the Apple. <laughs> the Apple. The Apple. The Apple. Yeah, the Apple. Yep. Yeah, I guess you were you were lying. You could picture. act. You know, you could yeah. act. He's like when he asked if you could act, you're like, well, I'm acting like I was prepared for this. So yeah, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I win. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty yeah. awesome. Like I don't know. I mean, like like living in Canada, going over to the UK, like all that. You know, you know, now you're in the US, right? You you live. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, I've lived um, here since I was 21. Oh wow, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So both yeah. well, both you and Steve, you know, like started very young. That's that's pretty great. It seems yeah. like a, it's it's the it's the time to do things. You know, now I'm in my uh, mid to late forties. I'm like, oh, you know, I want to try to give this acting thing a try. Like, <laughs> yeah. Me too. Well, it's yeah. ageless. I mean, you can do yeah. it. That's the thing. I I don't know if I'll ever be able to retire because it's like, oh, now I'm a mom. Now I'm a grandmother. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that's, you know, that, that's that's not a bad thing. You know, there's there's been a, a lot of, you know, actresses that have been able to to work for a very long time. And it's it's mm -hmm. great. I mean, you're still putting out like quality stuff. And it's, you know, it, so Steve, are you still acting as well? Or are you in the industry at all? Yeah, you know, I started in theater and as I've gotten older, theater is still my passion. Uh, nice. So, yeah, I've been I'm trying to do now that we've relocated here to North Carolina from LA, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different environment uh, in terms of audition mm -hmm. and shows and, and it's kind of a tight community. Um, or there's companies there and pretty, pretty much worked all the time. Hopeful that things will, will allow for, for, you know, hitting the boards, so. Nice. Yeah. So, where so, in North Carolina are you, Steve? Uh, we're in Asheville. 
Okay. Oh, cool. That's beautiful. I'm yeah, on the Outer yeah. Banks right now. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. That's great. I don't so, live here, but I we have a place out here, so mm -hmm. this is sort of where I'm. I we come to kind of relax. I've been it's been kind of go 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 for me the last few months, so it's kind of nice to just chill out and downtime, um, yeah. relax out here. That's great. So I'm guessing because you were in the apple, that taught you how to be a moss da. A moss da. Remember What's the that? song? I know how to be a. A master. Oh, master. Oh, my like, God. I was a master. A master. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, but, I mean, I, it seems like you did the apple. Now, did you do uh, um, powder heads before or after the apple? After the apple. Okay. Because yeah. Internet Movie Database has them switched. And I'm like, I think it's the other way. But um, so, like, you did the apple, and it just seems like you've been steady since you did the apple like yeah. i'm looking at your imdb and there's like maybe a two-year period where you didn't do something and then you did something for like ever and then there was like another two-year period but you've been steady for 40 years i mean that's insane I know, especially since I'm only 42 years old. I know. <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> you were like a dancer when you were two. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I know a lot of people, you know, connect you to this little movie here, which I mm -hmm. used to watch all the time on this, uh, you know, you RCA Select Division or whatever. <laughs> and they, wow. connect you to, they connect you to Night of the Comet. But you've done so many other incredible things like dudes. And you were on an episode of Mr. Merlin where you didn't speak. And you're on an episode of Knight Rider. And recently I watched um, uh, scenes from the gold mine. And uh -huh. oh, my God, woman, you have a voice. Like that, <laughs> la that ending song, Lonely Dancer. If you guys have not seen this movie, find it. Scenes from the gold mine. I mean... Your voice is incredible. I don't know why you like you need to put out like a Christmas CD or some kind of CD. Like uh, I I I don't know what would, I mean. I have so many things to ask you, but so does everybody else. So I don't want to like yeah. take it all up. But like you've worked with Alex Rocco and um, Michael Paré and Bruce Dern and you know Lance Guest and. Robert Beltran, and I'm just, you know, throwing these out in my head and not trying to look at my cheat sheet. Here, but, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, you've you've worked with so many people and done so many, you know, awesome things that, you know, have don't really connect to each other that that are just different and stuff. And, you know, I it just it's amazing. Which is kind of great, because that's sort of as a, a an actor, that's kind of your dream come true is try not to be pigeonholed too much and do the same thing over and over and over again. Mm. And I've been so, in my mind anyway, none of these movies are massively successful or anything, but one of the things that I loved about them so much is kind of the diversity of the characters that I've been able to play. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly the people that I've worked with, for sure. I mean, I worked with Rod Steiger twice, I, uh, once in um, a mini series called Hollywood Wives. I was just, as a matter of fact, I just did an interview uh, for that one um, two days ago. And the the cast is insane. I mean, the people that are in that cast, it was like Aaron Spelling. It was in sort of the mid 80s. And a lot of these had iconic actors were having trouble getting movie roles, big, massive movie roles that they were used to. There was a period there of about 10 or 15 years where they were doing movies that didn't involve like seriously iconic actors. And so they were doing, I'm sure Aaron Spelling paid them tons of money to do it. But, <laughs> and they weren't, honestly, they weren't that happy about it. I mean, they were just like, oh geez, okay, I'll do this now. Um, but I got to work with them. So I reaped the benefits of that. I did with Rod Steiger, Hollywood Wives, and then later I did a mini series called Passion in Paradise, where he played my father. I mean, and it's just like, who gets to do this stuff? I mean, I, I feel so grateful that I uh, fell into that sort of niche of time where I was exposed to this incredible talent. And hopefully I learned something from all these people, you know? Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> And Bruce I, Dern. Oh my God. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. 
He's yeah. awesome. He is hilarious. <laughs> uh, now, love that man. you know, for us, we have our favorite movie that you've done, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people are Starfighter fans and Night of the Comet fans and Weekend at Bernie's fans. But it's not about us today. It's about you, which is why you're here. Is there something that you did that you go, mm-hmm. you know, I like that. Everybody enjoyed my work in Last Starfighter and Bernie, the Weekend of Bernie's and Night of the Comet. But I did this thing that is so powerful that I don't think anybody's really seen it. But this is the thing that, you know, really resonated with me or the thing that I'm surprised nobody ever talks about this. Is there one project that you did in particular that for you is our Last Starfighter or our Night of the Comet? <laughs> Um, well, I did a movie, uh, well, the miniseries that I was talking about, Passion in Paradise, where Rod Steiger played my father, Armand Asante was in it, he played my love interest. It was based on uh, real events in the Second World War. It had to do, it was this sort of it, it, um, kind of complicated intrigue about, it involved the royal family and gold and the Second World War and the Nazis and the Bahamas. And I played this character that was a, a, a real character. And um, that for me was super challenging, but I also feel like, it, it, I mean, I hate the title because it, it sounds like it's some, um, it sounds like Hollywood wives in a way, you know, that kind of a thing, but it really is um, a really complicated, fascinating story of the time. And I wish more people had been exposed to it um so i'm proud of that uh in fact i was uh i nominated for a uh um oh, canadian oscar now what is it called oh geez oh geez um <laughs> sorry that's what it's called uh, sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> um anyway um it, it, which i was very very busy at the time and i didn't kind of respond to that so it just kind of fell, but you have to respond apparently to these things. And somebody says, can we, can you, we nominate you? I'm like, I'm busy at the moment. Um, <laughs> and I didn't take it seriously and I didn't have anybody mm-hmm. advising me of what to do, but um, I'm, re- I'm really proud of that particular project. So if anybody wants to look up Passion and Paradise, it's kind of interesting. Um, but I have to say, you know, I have so many wonderful memories of, of all, pretty much every thing that I've done, because again, they've been so different. And like the last Starfighter, for instance, was the first thing that I had done in um, Los Angeles in the States and first movie. I was working on Days of Our Lives at that time, which was just really hard work, really, really hard. And I was doing that and I got this audition for The Last Starfighter and I ended up getting the role. And it was such a beautiful experience in terms of it was a small film and it was just, I know this is very cliche, but it was really kind of a labor of love. Nick Castle, the director was just so sweet and kind in terms of young actors. Um, Lance and I are still friends to this day. We're still very, very good friends. Um, We just kind of clicked, you know, we just enjoyed working with each other. it, it, it just couldn't have been a nicer situation, frankly. And I know uh, Robert Preston, it was his last movie. I know I didn't work directly with him. I got to meet him once, which was like, oh. um, <laughs> but Lance has nothing but wonderful things to say about him and how he was so generous with his time. And, and you know, Lance was a young actor that just wanted to do the best job he possibly could. So he would ask Robert Preston, these, these are Lance stories, um, to, to if he w- would rehearse. And Robert Preston was like, absolutely, whatever you want. Um, it was just a lovely experience. And then the next show that I did was Night of the Comet. And what I loved about that was it was a complete departure because I'd sort of been typecast as the girl next door, you know, the apple. I just always like, you know, the sweet little Mm -hmm. California girl or whatever. So when this role came along, I was so excited because frankly, I feel like Reg in Night of the Comet is more who I am. I grew up with a couple of brothers. I I was always trying to get their attention and trying to keep up with them and all that other stuff. And I, 
I've always, I've never been like a girly girl. So um, that was super fun for me. I love doing like the stunts and, and the action and I like shooting the guns. I just loved all that stuff <laughs> that Night of the Comet represented, you know, like the independent, you know, girls can actually look after themselves in an apocalypse, you know, and, and uh, you know, as we, it, as it like 40 years later or whatever it is, so many people have come up to me saying, I wanted to be Reg, uh, you changed my life. You made me feel like I could do anything I wanted to do, which is, oh, I can't tell you how wonderful that is. If, if you, if, you know, if you can get anything out of that, this business and being on screen is extremely powerful and you can never take that for granted. And the audience, no matter how large or small, you influ hopefully influence them in a positive way. And I sort of feel like both those movies did. First of all, The Last Starfighter encourages you to, you know, just go after your dream. And Night of the Comet is, yeah, we're these young teenagers from the valley, but we can look after ourselves. Why not? I mean, wh wh who's to say? We can't. Um, so, I, I mean, and then I did, after that, I did this movie called Mischief that was set in the 50s, which also was so much fun because it was, I feel like it was authentically... 50s first of all um and and just uh, the yeah, they, they're just such a sweet story again um so i mean you know then i did dudes and i did world gone wild which were again completely crazy <laughs> departures but again so much fun i mean i have to say and and some actors like sort of rolled their eyes at me but because I just have so much fun. <laughs> I, I just love what I do and I revel in it. I love the eighties. I was so fortunate to be able to work a lot. Um, you know, I, there was time off because I got married and then we moved to New York and I had babies and, and that kind of put a wedge in, in, you know, the, the work cycle, I guess. But I was fortunate enough to get back into it. And I'm I'm still very involved in one the meeting that I had today was about this movie that I'm I co-wrote and I'm gonna direct and I'm producing and um it's been optioned in Canada and it's a really meaningful story for me. Um so that's very, very exciting. That's awesome. awesome. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And it, it, while you were uh, look, uh, talking, uh, Passion in Paradise is available on Freebie right now, which is oh. it's a free app. I actually watch quite a bit. There's like a whole Doctor Who channel that just streams Doctor Who like oh, three hours a day. Nice. So, but yeah, so but it's on Freebie right now. So that's one I'll be adding to my queue for sure. And yeah. Oh, cool! Yeah, there. yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's and, pretty cool. It's it's set in the '40s and um, or late '30s, and. Um, Again, the costumes and everything, it was, and, and then they, they include the royal family and, and it's cr crazy how well it's cast. Um, mm. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a one, I think I liked it. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally <laughs> like, I, I, I like, I don't care about the genre as long as it's just something just like well-made and just whatever. Like it, I, I tend to lead more towards <laughs> horror because there's just so much of it, but uh, yeah, anything sure. that's out there, uh, I don't care as long as it's quality. You know, yeah, I'll be down. Oh, cool. thank you. Yeah, what's funny? Chris, is... I love that you're in a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story. A market with my wife today, and I'm like, I'm not gonna drive home, set up. We can we can manage this today. Yeah, so, yeah. And it's pretty hot. So. I'm oh, sorry. Like, I'm like, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it's brutal. I was like, who's he trying to get away from? He's like, okay, I'm <laughs> my, my wife boy. behind me. <laughs> Sneak out to the car. Yeah, I'm gonna do a show on the car. Mm. It's yeah. a bit hot here. Yes. Yeah. You can't start the AC. I was going to, but I, she was talking. I didn't want to be interrupted. I I can sit here. I can deal with the heat. It's uh, not that bad. I open the windows. There's a breeze. I'm in guys? Londonderry, New Hampshire. There is oh, a okay. flea market up here, and uh, we we like to shop. And then we have too much stuff, so I'm like, let's get rid of it. And that's what we're doing this weekend. So no, oh, you actually yeah. visited New Hampshire or Vermont recently, didn't you? Are, are you asking me something? Yeah, didn't you recently come to Vermont and New Hampshire like last year? We were up in this area. Um, 
Uh, no, I love Vermont, but I mean, my my uh, daughter went to school in Maine, so I've been up in that general area. But um, no, I haven't Maine. been to New York. Yeah, it could have been Maine. So it's funny. I used to, like I said, I used to watch Last Starfighter like three times a week, and oh in, 19, in, in 1987 they were filming this little movie in a town called Bristol, Vermont, called The Wizard of Loneliness, starring Lance Guest. So uh, I was a production assistant and an extra on this film. And I'm standing there one day looking at Lance and, and I go, how's it going, man? You, you kind of look familiar. Have you done anything else? Right. <laughs> and I've seen the last Starfighter like, you know, a hundred times at this point. And he's like, yeah, I was in a movie called the last Starfighter. And I go, Oh my God, you're Alex Rogan. Like, <laughs> I felt so stupid because I had seen the movie so many times and he's standing in front of me and I couldn't quite figure out who he was. Like, it was mm. so weird. I'm like, Ugh. like that was my blonde moment or whatever. But, but yeah, he was wicked cool. Like on set every day. And you know, we'd all go and eat together and he'd be sitting at the table and he was just a regular nice guy or whatever. So yeah. Um, yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah, Arnold, yeah you, you, mentioned, uh, you had mentioned that she was in a movie, or you were in a movie with uh, with Michael Pere. What movie was that? That was World Gone Wild. That was with uh, Bruce Stern as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had him as on. Another... I, sorry, I had him on on uh, on my my other podcast like a couple of years back, and he was he was great because I, I was all about Eddie and the Cruises. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Right. And, um, and like uh, we were doing our our live ad, like we had to read an ad. And like he was still on, and he's just like, like in the middle of, he's like, "What the hell are you talking about?" And I'm like, I didn't realize what I was doing. And I was like, I'm like, it's an ad. It's just an ad. He's like, oh, all right. It was just weird. He thought we were asking him a question. We were talking about coffee. He's like, what are you talking about? I was, I was just funny. It's one of those things that I'll never forget because he's just like yeah. he looks so confused. It was great. Catherine, yeah, there, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, the rumor, there's the rumor mill has some information floating around that there may be a final sequel to Last Starfighter. Yeah, um, I heard that as well. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of talk that there is a script um, and there's there's a, a strong interest to follow up on that story. Uh, yeah. Anything you can shed on that or have you heard anything? I have. I've heard some okay. stuff too. I mean, um, about two or three years ago, pre-COVID, I guess, I, I, there's this vacuum of two years, which is COVID. <laughs> right? um, so yeah. it must have been like three years, three or, I'd say three years ago, um, where mm -hmm. Nick Castle, we all did a, this convention together, and uh, Lance, me, and Nick, and um, he even at a Q&A sort of announced that uh, mm -hmm. They were trying to sell this the script, Which, and the great thing about it is Jonathan Betchwell, the original writer, has written the sequel, mm -hmm. and which is fantastic mm -hmm. because it'll hopefully you know stay true to the I don't know the integrity of the, the movie, yeah, the original, right? And um, I so the the how it all came about was there's this new rule now, or I don't know, it could be ten years old, who knows? But I'm after 30 years, uh, the original writer of a script gets re the rights, recovers the rights to mm, their project to the right, yeah, okay. if, yeah. if they want to. And um, um, so Jonathan Betchel took advantage of that. And he, he probably had a script already. I know Nick talked to Lance and I years and years ago about mm -hmm. a potential idea for a sequel. Um, and so I guess they've been shopping it around. Uh, it's been, they've been doing that for a while and there's been some interest I know. I just don't know what the latest and greatest is about it, but uh, I, we've been given the basic storyline, which is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> takes you back to kind of the, the uh, sort of, I, w I don't wanna say the beginnings of The Last Starfighter, but it, it carries on in a, a very lin uh, linear in the sense that the same characters are involved 30 years later. Right. Um, so Lance and I would be involved and um, which is fantastic. They better do it soon. <laughs> <We're gonna have laughs> be great. So they were, they're sort of setting us up as parents, but uh, at the rate we're going, we might have to be grandparents. But um, 
I'm yeah, I you know, I haven't heard anything um uh you know, concrete for a long time, but uh hopefully, you know, something will happen. I'm I'm so excited about that. Yeah. Uh, that'd be that'd be just so much fun to do. Yeah, as, a as, a fan, oh, yeah. Yeah. as a fan, that would be gigantic. Like I, I saw, I saw it in the theater when I was a kid. Like Did I live in Central Massachusetts, but like in kind of like a really rough area. And there was a mm -hmm. there was a small movie theater that just to get kids off the street so they wouldn't like get in trouble. It would be free movies during the summer. Oh my god, that's yeah, so like, great really for showing stuff like that. So I would always go to whatever was coming out. That's how I saw Weekend at Bernie's. Like. I went to see it at the theater and it was yeah you know, it was awesome gotta love um, that oh yeah that was that was, that was a good question steve because i was actually going to ask it but what's oh, funny right. is 15 or 20 years ago um so i have two daughters that are 23 and my uh, my daughter actually turned uh my youngest turned uh 19 yesterday um so I got a 24 to 19 year old daughter but anyways for the past 25 30 years i've been collecting autographs and so Starfighter was one of my favorite movies. And so I tracked down Jonathan and I always thought it was Batool, um, but I tracked him down and I'm like, dude, I love this movie, blah, 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 blah. And so he sent, he, I sent him the, the linear notes from the last Starfighter DVD and he autographed it and sent it back or whatever. But I had been talking to him 20 years ago about this sequel. So like 20 years ago, he was telling me about it. And I'm like, when you make the sequel, can I be an alien? <laughs> like, and this was 20 years ago. So I yeah. still, I say to you, can I be an alien? Like, um, I, I would love to, you know, be in this movie if it ever does see the light of day. But yeah, I, I was talking to Jonathan about 20 years ago about it. Yeah. And it's just so funny that it's like now 20 years later, we're talking about it again. I say, yeah. let's stop talking about it. Yeah. Let's get it made. Like, let's seriously. Do it's it. Yeah. Where it's like, because you can do a lot more with technology nowadays, even if it's something yeah. that's not a theatrical release. Like, do like a like an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter. You have a billion fans of yeah. this movie. Yeah. So they, they would be all over it. And um, that'd be huge. You know, that, that would be that would be big for uh, the fans out there for I sure. I have such a distinct memory of, I was on the Universal lot at that time that it, it was in post-production. And I remember uh -huh. walking into the commissary and mm -hmm. seeing its poster up on the wall for The Last Starfighter. And the buzz was that they were using a Cray computer to do all these amazing visual effects. And at the time, you know, the Cray took up an entire room. It was so huge just mm -hmm. to create the digital effects for Starfighter. And now you can do it on your laptop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do it on I your mean, phone. It doesn't look bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It's totally appropriate for the movie, and it yeah. would it would actually be it would be pretty awesome if uh, they use the same style of effects. <laughs> they for the should style. absolutely. I think that would have to you know. I mean, oh my god, that would that would be, that would be awesome. Right. Yeah. Well, I the, you know it, CGI was that was the birth of CGI was the last Starfighter, right. honestly, and they were literally creating um, programs. As we were shooting the movie, they they weren't sure if they were going to just use traditional special effects with the models, or go with this newfangled CGI digital effect thing. Mm -hmm. And so they had these people like just pounding away on these computers, twenty four seven, I guess, from what I understand. And every once in a while, somebody would be like, "Eureka!" They've come up with something mm -hmm. that that worked. And um, but they were they had a very tight timeline to yeah. get the special effects out and um i know uh, this was at the i learned all this by the way at the 20th anniversary they did a screening and they had all the technical guys come up for the q a and um they were talking about this how they were frustrated because they they felt like if they'd had more time they could have you know made some more sophisticated um, images. Uh, for instance, uh, like the, you know, the rocks that they're sort of flying in and out of in yeah. outer space and mm -hmm. avoiding the bad guys. They said that they felt like that looked like melting chocolate ice cream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they no. could have probably added some more details had they had more time. Well, yeah. that, um, I, think, I, I think that, that time by, uh, by render time, the amount of time mm. it takes to render out 
those each individual shot and that's what cost them the time that they didn't have to put more detail in hmm. yeah i, I, I right. personally think that it adds to the charm of the movie and it actually it makes it stand fun, out yeah. a little bit exactly. too it makes it stand out like it yeah. like it, like everyone was doing miniatures and miniatures are great don't get me wrong i mean miniatures are awesome but this is completely something like you said something different and it it adds to the, it you know, adds it still to looks the charm great. of the film is what it yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. And also it makes The Last Starfighter iconic in that way because it was literally the first um, movie that was using this kind of uh, yeah. special effects, this kind of uh, digital um, images. Nobody had done it before. I mean, everybody says, oh, Tron was all digital and blah, blah, blah. But it was nothing compared to this. This right. was all, right. this was the Come foundation on, of what we see today. <laughs> no, I was going to say, two years before, Tron did it. And then he's like, Tron, blah. I'm like, oh, God, I'm not going to say blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Tron, like Tron. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Tron started it, but... Up. Uh, Last Starfighter kicked it into another level. I, hear. Yeah. I think so. From what I understand, it, it was literally the foundation for what you see today. Yeah. Um, and now, so, unfortunately, yeah. we rely on CGI too much, in my opinion. Yeah. So now we say, what explosion can we do? What can we do with CGI? Mm -hmm. And then let's write a story around it. We need to write the story mm -hmm. first and use the CGI to enhance the story, not be the story. And that's just right. my opinion. But I just think we rely on CGI too much now. And the stories like, you know, the heartwarming stories or whatever are gone. Mm -hmm. And we got, oh, look at that explosion. Look at that spaceship. Look at this you know, car rolling 40 times yeah. and we don't have a story. So I think it needs to enhance the movie and not be the movie, but that's just well, my The best opinion. use of CGI is when you don't know it's CGI. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like that, and that that's isn't what the about. movie's about, right? Right, right. But that's yeah. that's why I'm a fan. Uh, I'm definitely more of a fan, like over the last bunch of years of of like a lot of more independent stuff, like lower budget independent stuff, because they have to tell us a, a good story. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the Hollywood stuff I, is all the same stuff. I mean, it's all the same movie over and over again, and just like, oh, this looks awesome, and it does look awesome, but it's like, all right, there's no substance to it. You know, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what that that's one of the reasons that things like The Last Starfighter or Night of the Comet have had some sort of longevity is because these are, it's it's character driven yes. and the characters are relatable and this, there there's a story there that you can relate to. You know, like it's inspiring this kid, Al, Alex Rogan in the trailer park who has nothing going for him and he can't even get into state college. He has to go into community, you know, and then all of a sudden he's outer space, you know, saving the universe. <laughs> I right. mean, yeah, it's an extraordinary situation, but the message is there. And uh, people like to be taken through this, a story that inspires them that yep. they can relate to on some level. Um, same with Night of the Comet. That's what's so special about it for me is that I get so much feedback uh, from women and men about how like guys get a kick out of girls who can kick ass yeah. and girls, <laughs> girls see a, an image of their own potential. Uh, and, and then there's kind of a fun, I mean, Night of the Comet is unique also in that it crosses so many genres. It's <laughs> like this mishmash of so many different things, but that's what makes it work. And that's what makes it exciting and, and you, uh, unique and interesting for the audience. It's so 80s as well. Like it's, like, with oh, it being right, awesome. Yeah. Quintessential 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. And the same thing yeah, with yeah. Night of the Comet, like, oh, Night of the Comet. Uh, same thing with that last, uh, the last Starfighter. Like, I, it's, I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's I've never seen aliens look like that before. It's like all the aliens have male pad and bod, baldness. It's it's crazy. <laughs> and then, then, then the comment, you have that, that one, uh, I forget her name, the actress. She's in another movie that I absolutely love called uh, House of the Devil. But she's wearing her like one piece and she's got leg warmers on. It's the 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's just it's kind of work out. Yeah. yeah. Now, did they, did they film Night of the, the Comet? First I was going to just say, really, ahead, yeah. the very first scene in um, The Last Starfighter, when I'm uh, I'm walking through the trailer park and I have this sort of sweatshirt off my shoulder, that was very 80s, too. Yeah. I, that was totally yeah. intentional. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, did you film Night of the Comet in L.A.? And if you did, how did you shut down so many places yeah. to make it look like it was thing. like empty or whatever? Yeah. Early, yeah. early mornings, right? Well, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. in fact, you can never do that now because 80, uh, because downtown um, LA is now 
so residential. I mean, it's like mm. the hot place to live. They're just building yeah. these high rises. Back then, there was nothing. I mean, there was nobody living down there per se. There was a, a homeless situation, which is tragic, but um, yeah. where we shot, I mean, it was all banks and, um, you know, business oriented things. And we shot like Christmas morning. So oh, not wow. only there were no business people there, but there was no residential stuff set up. And um, we it, it was a very low budget movie. It was under a million dollars. Uh, so we didn't have yeah. like a police force to hold back traffic. And I guess there's one scene and I still haven't. I, I can I don't know if I've actually seen it or not, because I can sort of see it in my mind. But then I look in the at the movie and I'm like, where is that scene where there's a, like it's after the comet has passed and I'm riding the motorcycle through downtown LA. And I guess in the far background, a, a car sort of pulls out into the intersection a little bit. Um, I think he's got a stoplight, so phew. Um, but, uh, but I guess you could say there was a zombie driving it. I don't know. Um, but otherwise, it, what you see is what you get. There was nobody there. It was, it was deserted. Wow. wow, which is incredible. Yeah, I wondered that. I mean, the yeah. whole intelligent zombie thing too—that was something that's yeah. completely different, you know. Even yeah. still, you know, like yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was such a slow process for them to become that. Um, but right, I, I, that's the thing is you don't people don't really go with that nowadays. It's all just like oh, I'm just brains, whatever. Just want some yeah. brains. When I, yeah. when I when I talked to Lance um, back in '87. He said that that trailer park that you guys filmed in in Last Starfighter was a real trailer park, and I hear that it no longer exists. It, do you know if that's true or not? Um, I think that is true. I just this is hearsay. I mean, fans will send photographs of the little store or gas yeah. station or whatever it was at the top of the hill there, um, and it was a trailer park that uh, I don't think it was massively occupied. And they probably paid the people to leave and then they dressed it, you know, they made it look what they made it look like, which was fantastic. <laughs> Almost right. like a cartoon. Like, um, I wanted to live there. Like yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm like, I want to move here. A cool community. I, like it's yeah. like a camping resort almost. Yeah. Football and video games. Everyone was looking out for each yeah. other. It was awesome. Yep. Yeah. I know, right? It was just like this perfect little civilization all its own. Mm -hmm. Classic um, characters. Each one was so uniquely different. Yeah, and that's what sells it because they work great as an ensemble, you know, in bringing right. those characters to life. So, and it's yeah. probably yeah. too like that, you know, because there's such a difference. Obviously, when he's in space, it's way different than what's going on in trailer park. But it's so interesting. You don't mind when it switches back and forth. Like sometimes you're like, hey, get back to the space stuff. But like, <laughs> no, like, I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah because, well, the beta unit was down there keeping things interesting. Uh, yeah. oh and you never God. knew what was going to go on with him. I mean, one of my favorite scenes was, you know, at the lake where we're uh, kind of making out and he's not doing such a great idea. A uh, great job, I should say. And um, he says, you know, he he hears Jack, I guess it is, right? Talking, uh, I'm going to talk dirty to you now. Or she says, talk dirty to me now, whatever. Do you remember that? He could hear yeah. across the lake. Mm -hmm. And he, she sort of look. I'm like, oh, geez, you're not doing a great job here. And I turn over. He says, you want to, do you want me to talk dirty to you now? And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and then he gets shot. And then that little bloop of green stuff comes out yeah anyway he starts to explain or whatever i'm a beta unit i'm from outer space and i'm like what i love that the the whole scene from there through where the the pod that he blows up he drives the truck into the pod yeah i just love that whole sequence i mean it was like a, a comedy it was action it was drama it was special effects it was love you know i'm sitting i love you alex rogan you know at the end <laughs> of the explosion behind me. Uh, oh my god i love that so much it was like a fantasy for me and not as, only a, did as a kid though like when they the, the first time you see the beta unit when they pulled out like the sheet down and it's like that white thing and it's like yeah. i'm like that was terrifying i was like thank goodness <laughs> They didn't continue with that. <laughs> and I was just like, right, this, I know he's, he's being taken over bubbling, for that. Like, no. bubbling up into formation. Yeah. I know that was, that was pretty terrifying funny. as a kid. I mean, not only did uh, yeah. uh, Lance have to be Alex, but he had to figure out how to play the beta unit differently so that you would believe that it was a beta unit and not just, 
Yeah, so that was well played. My favorite scene was when you were guys in the truck and Lance is just kind of sitting there like this and you go, you need to relax and, and, and whatever. And then you say something like, I don't know, laugh. And he goes, <laughs> oh my God, that kills me every time when you say, maybe laugh a little bit. And he goes, <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, like that, that just cracks me up every single time. But yeah, it's just, again, it's one of those movies that I think people like us who, you know, were watching 80s movies and seven for some of the 70s movies, it was just one of those movies that like resonated with everybody, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, everybody just loved it. And then again, then we get Night of the Comet and I'm like, hey, that's the girl from the Starfighter, movie, you know, when I'm, you know, <laughs> younger or whatever. And I'm like, I have to watch this because she was awesome in that other movie or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, I. It's just one of those and ones yes, that holds let's up. All admit it, let's all admit it, guys. We all had a crush. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> crush. See, I wasn't going to yeah. go there, but. Uh... <laughs> so, I, I, I texted. I, I told these guys this before we started, but I texted I a friend of mine yesterday. Aww, and, uh, thank and you, like, guys. I'm like, we're going to have her on the on the, uh, on the the show that I'm going to do with RW. And she, he's just like everyone's first crush. I'm yeah. like, it's everyone's first crush. <laughs> I'm like, She's like, oh, look at the time. I got to go. So, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm married, guys. No. But one thing, too, I wanted to bring up, because uh, I know you do, uh, I, you're not at a lot of cons, but I know you do a lot. You do cons, because uh, a yeah. guy that's on my other show, he's met you at least once, maybe twice. And um, he has nothing but nice things to say about uh, when you, you're at the shows. Like, you're very, very approachable. Sometimes people are intimidating, you know? Um, but you're not. So it's, uh, it's great. And do you have any cons coming up, possibly, where people can go see you? I do actually. I just did one in New Mexico, the Duke nice. City in Al Albuquerque, which was really fun. Um, I'm doing a flashback weekend in Chicago, the weekend of August 5th. Hmm. Did you so, just do the one in, there was just, I think there was one of those in, Atl in uh, Atlantic City, I think. I did, I did something just, uh, yeah, um, a few months ago. A couple, yeah, a few months ago in Atlantic City too, yeah. Okay. I think that um, might have been where you met you, like the last time. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah. yeah. I always um, forget but, the names of these. You know, I'm not, yeah. I, it's always, I have a rep who says, okay, well, you want to do this one then? I'm like, okay. And um, <laughs> yeah. some people just, you know, do them over and over again and they have them all figured out. And I just yeah. kind of show up and I don't necessarily remember what they're called or where right. I am. Well, there's like, a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of people that I see a lot at the cons and it's, you know, nothing, nothing bad about, about them at all, but it's oh, like, gosh, no. like their careers like made, like they're not really working anymore. So they, they rely on the cons and like, that's why I like supporting them at the cons. Cause it's like, they gave me a part of my childhood. Like, yeah. Yeah. I have no Positive problem memory. 25 bucks for an autograph or whatever it is, yeah. you know, that's, you know, they, Huge part of my childhood, uh, you know, even there's some people that now where like I go to a con and I'm like, you were just in a movie like three years ago and it, it kicked my butt. So here you go. Here's some money. I appreciate it. But oh, nice. it's great. I, I love going to con. So if anyone listening or watching um, is in that, you know, in the area, go go see her. And and Steve's got a con coming up as well. Um, I wanted to, oh, cool. Let me just see. I'm going to add this real quick. And yeah. There it is. Uh, wants so to he's going to be there the with Daniel. Monster Mania. Who in, yeah, who you were in dudes with. Mm. Yeah. I, I know Daniel Roebuck. He's, you know, he is one of the most lovely person people you'll ever meet. I, I adore him. But we're still friends, too. I, see, I don't see him often because he lives in Los Angeles, but... He's been, he, he is doing, he grew up in Philadelphia, I guess, and he's, he's producing and directing movies of his own. So nice. I've been out there. I, uh, I went to a screening of his, he's just a lovely, we have a mutual friend in New York, actually, an actress. Um, I love Daniel. So please say hi to Daniel for me, Steve. <laughs> I will. What, yeah. It What's the like movie? Well, yeah, blast on Dudes. Looks like you had a blast on Dudes. Again, I mean, I have spent my life living vicariously through my characters. <laughs> That's why I have so much fun. Like you were talking about scenes from the gold mine where I got to play this kind of, uh, talking about 80s, holy moly. Um, this uh, singer, you know, that joins this band, this innocent sort of young girl that's like a, a talented musician and she joins this band and gets stabbed in the back basically. Yeah. Um, 
oh my gosh, that was like a fantasy job for me. And I would say the same for dudes because I, I grew up loving Westerns and just fantasizing about riding horses across the range, you know, or the desert or something like that. And so dudes, I get to play this kind of, she owns a gas station. She can twirl guns and shoot them, bam, bam, bam. She uh, cans off a fence. Uh, I teach Jonathan Cryer how to do that or John Cryer. Um, and then I, you know, have a, this, I get to ride horses. I get to do all this stuff. So it's just like, for me, it's like, this is the coolest thing ever. I get to be <laughs> this person now, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's, and that's, uh, that's streaming on Tubi right now. If anyone wants to see that, that's also streaming for free on Tubi. Um, yeah. So yeah, go check out dudes. I haven't seen dudes, so I'm going to check uh, it out. I was, watching, I was watching a demo reel and I saw the gun go back into the holster backwards. I'm like, that's awesome. Then I saw you. <laughs> I had to learn how to I'm do assuming, that. I'm assuming it was you that was really riding the horse. Yeah. I, okay. in fact, uh, there's one scene where, um, so John Cryer and I are kind of getting romantic and I take him out on a horseback ride and, um, there's a scene where I'm run it, literally galloping full out towards the camera and he's like, Whoa! <laughs> you know, trying to follow up, follow me. But, um, what happened there was, so I'm supposed to run towards the camera and like go off to the side, right? Full out. It was a long shot. This was back at, when we were still shooting at 35 millimeters. So you don't want to waste a lot of footage. Yeah. And um, so I'm galloping, galloping, galloping towards the camera and somebody from the crew pulled their Jeep up right behind the camera. So if I exit off this way, they, they parked the, their Jeep there, just behind the camera. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm running full out here. <laughs> I, I have maybe 10 feet foot grace, you know, to, to pull off after, after crossing the lens, um, getting out of the shot. So I'm like, okay, I'll just, I'll just do it and I'll yank the, well, so these are, by the way, movie horses. They, they just, they do what they're told to do and they know what to do. I mean, you can try to do different things with them and they're like, yeah, no, I'm doing what I was told to do. And that's <laughs> so, so I'm galloping, 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 galloping. And I get to just off camera and I, pull the horse and the horse just stopped. He just went brr, 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 and I kept going. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and I went right into this Jeep or whatever it was. And oh, no. um, they, everybody of course freaked out because it, I was going pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> and I got up and I said, I'm fine. I feel fine. And I did feel fine. And they said, look, you need to go to emergency to make sure you're okay. And I'm like, okay, but I'm fine. I feel fine. I yeah, I hit the thing, but I'm fine. <laughs> so I go to my trailer and I start um, getting changed to go to the emerg emergency. And I, with my arm, I kind of leaned on the counter to, I was, I was being a little careful. I wasn't sure. I was making sure. I leaned on the counter with my arm to whatever, put my pants on or whatever. And oh my God, my arm just went. <laughs> and I was like, okay something's going on here mm -hmm. well it turned out i'd broken my arm but it was a oh, clean yeah. break through the ulna oh. and um uh so yeah so i had to have a cast and we had like three days of shooting left so i got some serious painkillers i had a removable cast <laughs> back then they were still plaster <laughs> way back in the old days <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back in the oh old my age. god <laughs> yeah, thirty-five millimeter and plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and no and your digital phones and your beeps and your whistles and your loud music. Sorry. And for all you gamers out there, you do some voiceover work for Red Dead Redemption. Red Dead Redemption Two, one of my favorite yeah. games. Yeah. So how did you oh, get? You how go. did? How did you get into that? Well, yeah, that was a mystery for me. I was like, I, my commercial <laughs> agent set me up on this audition and I'm like, okay, whatever. I walk in there and they said, okay, just sort of walk around in a circle. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> I walked in. I didn't really have to say anything. I just introduced myself or whatever on camera. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what this is, but whatever. Well, a couple of months later, I get this call 
And um, they're like, uh, it's for this Red Dead Redemption thing. I've never done anything like, like this. I, I, what's that? He said, pardon I said, me. Pardon me a moment. Um, Continue to talk. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, you put these uh, body suits on with all the little dots on you and wow. you go into this massive, um, like it's a warehouse with cameras everywhere so they could do a 3D thing. Literally, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no <laughs> idea what's going on here. Um, you have a whole head thing, everything. And um, I played this character called Moira. Uh, I don't, I've never seen me <laughs> in it or found me, but I guess in these, these, I mean, you guys know better than I am. Okay. I do. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you can take different, you know, you all have all these options of where to go or what to do or whatever. And I guess Moira shows up in this alley talking to somebody rather. But that was that was fascinating. It was a fascinating um, process and experience. I mean, it was like when you when you're not talking, you're supposed to keep moving for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> just just uh -huh. keep moving. I don't know why. So I'm just like, <laughs> so anyway, into, Bill. Yeah, that's a good thing to get into, though. There's a there's a lot of uh, like a, a lot of actors and uh, you know that switch over and. You go to I go to different conventions. I go to like a lot of Comic Cons and stuff too. And like there's people that are there because of the voice work, but they've done all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I see E. G. Daly at like cons for her voice work, but it's like, but you were Dottie in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and you were also in Thirty One by Rob Zombie, and like like it's like I'm like I don't know. It's just it's it, it's crazy. Like it's good though. It's a good thing to, to diversify. You know, well, Kane sure. Hodder does it all the time. Kane you Hodder, he's he does it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Randy Circus got started. Oh yeah, with all the mocap stuff. So it and it led to a lot more of work for him. So yeah, yeah. No, so, what uh, you... you know, I was gonna say a lot of the actors on Red Dead Redemption Two had been doing this whatever I guess one or whatever, and they'd been involved with it for years. Yes. And um, they were they were that's how they were making a living as an actor. You know, I thought, ooh, this is a good gig. And the other interesting thing about it was. Once you got into the studio, the whole setup, whatever it was, you couldn't even go outside because if if they were so afraid of somebody figuring out what the story was going to be or whatever, you couldn't like step outside because maybe somebody was wearing cowboy boots or something like that. I don't know what it was. It was it was you were in lockdown, put it that way, because it hadn't come out yet. And they were creating this whole new thing, and they make billions of dollars doing it. Um, it was it was a fascinating experience. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. what are you coming out or coming up soon that you're either worked on that's going to be released, or something you're working on now? Uh... Well, um, what I'm working on mostly right now is this project of my own that I wrote and I'm going to direct and all that stuff. That was, I was talking about that a little bit earlier. It's, I can't really say a lot about it, but I co-wrote the script and it's a, it's a very meaningful script for me, but it's also very contemporary. I mean, um, I brought a lot of myself into it, into the script and it's kind of a mother daughter thing, but, and, and so there's a lot of sort of me and my daughter in it, in the story, but um so that's, you know, moving forward. And I'm very excited about that. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, you know, I'm just, there's a couple of little things that are in um, like post-production or they're, they're selling or what. If you go onto imdb.com and look me up, you'll see kind of the, the, the sort of list of things that there's one, a potential thing in the future. Uh, yeah, but there's a couple of, uh, there's a yeah a couple of other things that are just waiting to come out nice. um so i'm well, still pretty active yeah that's awesome is there is there anywhere people can go to like follow you like for updates on stuff like uh do you post absolutely on or anything or? yeah for sure i mean i'm on facebook i have a a, a public page on facebook yep. and people can message me talk to me that way easy. I, I try to keep up with that stuff as much as I can. Um, and I also have a, I'm on, 
you know, I'm on, well, IMDb, you can see whatever's coming up in terms of what I'm doing. Um, Instagram, Twitter, uh, uh, I have a, an email address, info at katherinemarystewart.com. If anybody wants to email me something, I get a lot of requests for past there, which is great. I love doing fun. Um, yeah, so I'm available and, uh, you know, I think slowly becoming obsolete, but I'm right in there because oh, no. Again, far well, from no, 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 far from it, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> like I say, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your stories today and for agreeing to do this. I mean, you know, oh. I'm, I'm not, I say I'm a nobody, but I'm a somebody, but I'm like, I'm not some, you know, Josh Gad person who gets the Goonies together or anything. So <laughs> the fact that you were like, yes, I'll do it. I was like, Oh my God, that's so exciting. And um, again, I just, you know, want to thank you for like, Kevin said earlier, uh, I think we've all said at some point, but thank you for being there. Like, yeah, you know, I, I struggled as a kid. Uh, I don't want to get into it, but I had a rough time in school. I had a rough time at home and watching movies and TV shows and stuff was my escape so that I could like forget the world outside of what was going on. And, you know, so I thank you for being one of those people that helped me through, mm. you know, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know what else to say, but thanks for being here. And uh, uh, honestly, yeah. that means so much to me, and I'm I'm so grateful for any little part of that that I I ha was lucky enough to be a part of. So um, thank you so much for that. And you guys are awesome. And hey, Steve, maybe I'll see you at a convention. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Our paths may cross. May yeah, this cross. is his yeah. first one, actually. Uh, the one my that's my coming up. One. Oh, oh really? Yeah. More to follow, I think. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have the, the so thing... much fun. They're yeah. fun, and and the people you know that come and uh, greet you and all that other stuff. They're so wonderful, and and uh, I mean, obviously, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, enjoy. It's it's exhausting. It can be exhausting because you know you you're sort of you want to be up for everybody all sure. all day, but it's worth it. It's so worth it because people well, that's are good. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any yeah. Panels or anything, Steve? Like, are they having uh, panels at the at the convention? I'm not sure yet. I haven't found. I haven't. It's still those are, those are cool too. I like I like going to those. October, yeah, those so, you know, there's time to to formulate something there. But yeah. Nice. And so, so Steve, yeah, is there anywhere where people can go to to find your information, like keep up on, on what you're working on? Yeah, there's um, there's an electric company fan club on Facebook that's fairly sizable uh, for the series. Uh, so uh, a few of us from the cast, the original cast, participate in uh, in those chats. You know, they're always posting segments and wanting to know what happened, what it was like. You know, how was Cosby on this day or how was Morgan Freeman on that day or whatever, yeah, you know, awesome. that's, that's so it's fun. You know, it's it's 50 years ago and it's like, wow, wow it's still making an impact. You know, yeah, it's just amazing. So, it was a, that was an awesome show. I watched it myself. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask, did you watch Electric Company? Yeah. It's one of yeah. My favorites as well. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to turn it, it on. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to bring you the power. Yeah, we're coming down the line, strong as it can be, with the courtesy of the electric company. And then you had Morgan Freeman going, "Easy reader, that's my name." No sounds and the hit sounds. Yep. Talk about it, iconic. Wow, we. Yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. Made pretty amazing experience. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I dabble in the acting thing as well. I've never got to your guys' caliber yet, but I've got about 26 credits on IMDb, and, and I have to agree with you. Like, every project is different, whether it's a commercial uh, TV pilot, which I did one with, uh, I wasn't in a scene with him, but Corbin Burnson, it's called Zodiac, and I played Hades. Um, and yeah, every, everything you do is a different thing, and you meet more people, and you have so much fun. Like, whether it's riding horses, not getting thrown into a cheap with the riding horses bar, uh, or, you know, pretending to be someone from outer space or, you know, the world civilization is wiped out and there's only a few of you left, or, you know, you're an artist playing keyboards and, you know, someone's stealing your song. It gives you a chance 
to become something you're not and connect with, like I say, growing up wasn't fun for me. So TV and movies was my way of like, you know, oh, there's a better world out there or whatever. Right, and, right, right. You, you know, so um, that's why I, you know, wanted to be an actor. And at almost mm -hmm. 57, the past maybe 10 years, I've done a lot of cool stuff or whatever. And it's just, I, I know I speak with the same as Steve and, and Catherine. And it's just, it's like the first day there, you're like, okay, I got to meet these people. And then it's like, okay, scene, you know, we're doing this scene. And you're like, okay. And it's, action and you're like yes and you know it's just uh, so, and then it's like, like and then it, it's, right? yeah and then it's like action that's a wrap and you're like wait it's right. over what yeah. do you mean it's over yeah. we're, we're done already. you know like it goes by so fast it's anti but, it's anticlimactic yeah. but i understand that you're starring in the sequel to the last starfighter so i'll look for that right i hope so <laughs> if you can if you can put a good word for me like i say <laughs> one of my favorite uh characters was greg dan O'Hurley, and he was he was pretty up there in age when he did that. So like yeah. to be, I don't know if he was like in his eighties or whatever, but to have that much makeup at 80 years old, I mean, that's insane to me, but I would love to be that kind of a, because <laughs> that's what you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was, 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 like this funny laugh or whatever. I'd love to just be, you know, even if I didn't get to say anything, it would be so yeah. cool to be like, wow, I grew up with this movie and here I am an alien in the background there. R.W., you, know, uh, you should you should do a cosplay as 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 that character. You should figure just, that out. Yeah, just yeah. walk around the cons going. Yeah, totally. No, so if you guys don't, if, I don't know if uh, if Steve and Catherine know, but uh, R.W. is like uh, he's a pretty great cosplayer. He's like pretty, yeah, pretty oh, fantastic. Oh, cool. I don't know how many characters you were that first day, but every time I saw him at the con, he was a different character. Like he just he's would, a quick change or like yeah, like forty yeah, minutes yeah, for sure. run out, come back in with a different character, and like. Completely sell it every time. It was great. So that's oh. that's that's how it became. I'll be looking for you as Greg. There you go. That's a new one for you. Take that out. Yeah. What what's that, Steve? So that's a new one for you to take on now. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. But uh, okay. I mean, I if in, unless you have anything else that you need to tell us, Catherine, because like I say, this is your show. Um, I, I just, again, I can't thank you enough. And I, I know everybody else in here can't thank you. Enough yeah, for thank you either. so much. You know, You're like welcome. this was great. My pleasure, you guys. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully. And I'm not in my car anymore. See, I've I know, I know. Blue you can do the weather. You can, blue background. You can, you can do the weather report over <laughs> here in sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> it, it is, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, I got uh, some serious storms going on here on the Outer Banks. I don't know what's like in Asheville, but it's like yeah, we've had we've had rain today. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of great because it's kind of cleanses everything, but it's in serious wind and rain. It's great. Before you uh, joined us, right Steve was telling that, yeah. us a story. He was working on a film, and uh, did you say Ohio? Is that what it was? We were in Ohio. And it rained for 30 days. 30 days straight. <laughs> That's some biblical stuff right there. Oh, man. it was. We couldn't oh. do any exterior shots. We had to do all interiors. And we ended up sitting in the darn hotel for a month, you know, um, just earning per, di per diem. <laughs> you oh, know? Nice. That's so. unbelievable. Yeah. What was that movie? It was a two-part movie for television that starred Betty Davis. Uh, it was called yeah. The Dark Secret of Harvest Home. Yeah, wow. it was based on Tom Tryon's novel. So, how cool is that? 1977, <laughs> Universal. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And Betty Davis, did you get to meet her and everything? I had many scenes with her. Yeah. It was oh quite, wow. Quite what, was she? Yeah. Was she awesome, or was she? What was she? She was, she was intimidating. I mean, all all four foot nine of her. She's like looking up at you. Right. <laughs> you know, she when she entered a room, you knew it. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really I just want to make sure that Catherine saw uh, this comment from John John M. Young. Nice seeing you again, Catherine. And uh, oh. yeah, always a pleasure. Oh, See nice. You. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right well, guys. That's, yeah, that's it. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and uh, till the next time. Right. Yes. Yeah. We'll have you Thank again. you, Catherine. Appreciate it. I'd very love much. to. I'd love to talk to you guys again. Awesome.